So thanks for, for joining us this afternoon for the RTC on Debian track. Um, for our final presentation, we've got a, a special guest. We've got Emil Ivov, the lead developer and founder of the Jitsi project, formerly known as SIP Communicator. Um, the project now does SIP and Jabber and other protocols. Um, Emil is um, one of the real leaders in the free multimedia and real-time communications community. He's involved in the IETF processes. He's participated in FOSTEM and all the other major events in free software. Um, so, so I'm going to introduce Emil, and away you go. Thanks, Daniel. That's a great presentation. Thank you. So today, I am going to talk about the things that we have running in the JITSI community, um, which has been around for 10 years now. Uh, we just had our 10-year birthday a couple of months ago. Um, it's been quite a ride. So today, I'm going to talk about what JITSI can do and all the projects and all uh, that, that we have spun off from JITSI and um, the things that we're currently working on, the things that we have planned for the near future, and all this. Um, we, by the way, just got accepted in Debian. So uh, that was that's something we're very happy with. We've had our Debian packages for quite a while, but uh, now it just we just feel different. <laughs> that well, thank you, by the way, too, for for that. Um, so Jitsi started out as um, a multi-platform instant messaging and communicator. Uh, today, it supports a number of protocols that you can use for instant messaging presence. And on top of that, you can do audio and video calls and conference calls with XMPP and CEP. This is, this is what the application looks like. Um, it, as I said, it does audio and video calls. Uh, we support a very wide range of codecs. Actually, uh, I would claim that we are the most feature-rich communications applications around. That's our thing. We do a lot of stuff. And um, it used to be at some point back in the past that some of that stuff was somewhat, you know, gadgety, somewhat useless, but today we try to concentrate on things that can really make working together remotely very, uh, a very lightweight process. We actually work on Jitsi using Jitsi. Uh, so we support codecs like Opus, uh, Silk, G722. We even have G729 for those that would want to use it for some reason, it's just not compiled by default for all those licensing issues. We have H.264 and VP8 for video. Uh, by default, Jitsi sends uh, 640 by 480 video. You can configure it to send 720p and have HD codes, which works especially well if you have a good webcam like the one that Daniel showed a minute ago. We do conference calls, and note that this is not the kind of conference call when you, where you just go into a SEP conferencing server and then the client just sees that as a regular call. Jitsi can actually host conference calls. In other words, you just start five, six, ten different codes to different people, and Jitsi mixes the audio from all of those codes, and, um, and you can all talk together. And you can do that on your, on your own computer without having any constraints on the server. You can do it over SIP, over XMPP, and it's going to work. Um, one of the things that we are really proud of and that we uh, try to work on as, as much as possible, we really care about, is... Um, is the security aspect of the application and the privacy aspect. And um, there are several ways, uh, several things that you need to take care of when you are talking about privacy and security with VoIP. Obviously, securing the signaling is one of them, but um, you then get to securing the media, uh, securing what's actually being said, making sure that not only no one can understand what's being said by looking at the packets, but even protect you against man-in-the-middle attacks. That is, if someone is in between you and your correspondent, they can still, you can st still protect against them, or at least know very clearly that there might be a chance for that to happen. Um, and we do that using SRDP and the ZRDP key negotiation method. That's, if, for those of you who are not aware of it, it's... Um, uh, negotiation method designed by Phil Zimmerman, the creator of PGP. And it basically comes down to Jitsi showing you the four-letter hash of the key that got negotiated between you 
and your correspondence so that you can compare those letters. And if you have the same, you just click on the button. You do, you do this only once. Uh, you click on the button and you, um, and you know you are secure. And that's something WebRDC cannot uh, claim today. Um, I, I'm actually ready to argue that it's probably never going to be able to claim that, given how it's supposed to work with um, how easily it is to just serve different JavaScript to, to different users and, um, to, and, 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 and how difficult it would be for the browser to indicate reliably when communication is secure. Uh, but even if we get, if, even if we forget uh, the future discussions and uh, arguing uh, between DTLS and ZRDP, today WebRDC does not have uh, that. So if you want to be secure, uh, this is a pretty decent way to get there. Um, we also support other encryption mechanisms just for interoperability's sake. And of course, we are also going to support DTLS, even though we believe it is inferior to Sorry, am I moving too much or? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, even though we believe it is inferior to, to the RDP, we're going to support it just so that when next time someone here asks, hey, can I go from that web page to Jitsi? We would be able to answer yes. Because um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that WebRDC is something I don't like. It's going to serve a great purpose for a great many different use cases. And we would like to be able to use Jitsi in some of those use cases. So that's eventually going to happen. We also support encryption for chats and instant messaging. This is an end-to-end -end encryption method. It's called OTR. It means of the record um, instant messaging. And um, again, it protects you against uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, and it works over any, any protocol. Uh, it's not something that's limited to uh, to XMPP, for example, it does not. It is not something that secures your connection between you and the server. It just makes sure that between you and the other person, um, there's an encryption going on, and no one can listen in on uh, what's happening and what what's being said. We also support the NSSEC uh, that got in implemented uh, actually by uh, a Swiss contributor, Ingo Bauerzax, recently. It's, we are currently doing. Uh, he's currently working on a on a on a rewrite of that part so that it's going to be more lightweight and more um, uh, more easy to to package and run reliably. But we already do support it. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of DNSSEC, that basically allows you to discover your SIP servers or XMPP servers in a reliable way so that no one can lie to you and make you connect to their SIP server or their XMPP server um, and then potentially um, eavesdrop on your traffic, or at least, because with ZRDP that wouldn't be possible, but at least see who you're calling. Uh, and you might not want to do that. You might want to avoid it. We support video conferencing as well. Now, uh, we support it on Jitsi. There are two ways you can do it. You can have Jitsi do the, be the, the conferencing server. Obviously, for that, you would need the organizer of the conference to have very decent bandwidth. And I'm going to talk more about that in, um, in a minute. Or uh, we have taken apart the parts of Jitsi that do the video conferencing. And we have created the Jitsi Video Bridge uh, project, uh, which is obviously also open source, which is probably going to go. Uh, I mean, we are certainly going to submit it to Debian. Hopefully, it's going to be there at some point. Um, I have a few more. I would have very much loved to run a demo, but um, for several reasons I won't be able to. So I have a number of screenshots here. All of these are real calls. Uh, it's just regular calls that we had while working on Jitsi. None of this is Photoshop. This is actually one that we took on them uh, on our booth. Um, so none of these are uh, reworked images. It's just conferences that we had. Uh, and I've just taken snapshots. Uh, we do run on uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. We support RPM and uh, Deb packages on our website. Obviously, now we are also in Debian, so that's a great thing. Uh, and we are also currently working on an Android version, which is still a little bit shaky, but um, it's getting there. And all of the features that are, that are in GT are eventually going to find their place in the Android version as well. This means all the things like XMPP, Moody user messaging, and, and SIP calls, and being able to look up a user in LDAP, and all these things. So we have the, the tablet version here. Uh, here's a chat on, 
on the phone version, the contact list on the phone version, a call with XMPP, sorry, going on the um, uh, on a, on a phone. Um, we also support desktop streaming, um, and we do that in a very simple way. We simply capture a video of your desktop and send that over as if it was as if it were a simple video call, uh, which is very practical because it makes it multi-platform. In this case, we have a Mac OS user uh, s watching uh, the desktop of a Debian user, and uh, you can actually even take control of the remote desktop, and that's also possible with with Jitsi. Although, admittedly, that feature needs a little bit more work and because it relies too much on the server being stable right now, and it could be done. Um, it could be improved in that way. Uh, we have, yeah, that probably no one cares about it, but I, I, I thought I'd mention it because actually that helps when you want to make enterprises move to open source software. Uh, so it's... Um, it's it's great to be able to say, oh, you know, it's going to be the same. It's going to be able to do the same things that Link is currently doing, or or Skype is currently doing. Uh, you don't have to dump into everything right now. You can start by moving to Jitsi, and you're still going to be able to start calls from Outlook. And they're going to go through Jitsi this time, not Skype and not Link. So that's I believe that's important. Um, and we have a number of other features. Again, we uh, we we. We work a lot on that, and uh, we support a number of codecs. We have things like native uh, echo cancellation, uh, depending on the platform. We have spawned libgt, which is a media library that one can use, for example, to build server-side software for multimedia real-time communication applications. That actually works together with WebRDC. Um, we, um, there's, a, there's a project at Telecom Italia Labs, for example, that uh, does WebRDC to PSTN interconnection, and they rely on, on LibJT for that. One of the things that's not here, and that probably came up earlier today, is Ice4J. That's a nice, imp that's a Java implementation of um, Stun, Turn, and Ice, and um, that uh, can also be very helpful for, um, for, for, for not traverse. So even when not using Jitsi directly, we can use it with other projects or server-side projects. When talking to WebRDC, um, and uh, that's also something that we hope to be able to uh, to integrate in Debian, because part of the uh, the, the adventure of uh, integrating our package in in Debian, and that was a great adventure, because we have a lot of dependencies. Many of them come from ourselves, but many of them are third-party libraries, and being able to track them down, uh, because some just um, for some, we were just using an old version that was already doing everything that we needed it to. We, and, and, and since then, the project just died, for example, so we had to track down the sources and be able to get all that before submitting it to Debian. Uh, so our first, our first submission was really one a relatively rough package for Jitsi, and we uh, are hoping to now get to splitting that into several packages, like, for example, getting libgt apart, Jitsi Video Bridge, so that you can... Uh, get these libraries and build applications with them, even um, even if you're not planning on using Jitsi itself. Um, we have um, also made sure that um, you can use existing protocols such as SIP and XMPP today in a way that um, that takes the best from both worlds. Now, I'm not sure to what extent people here are familiar with SIP and XMPP, but in general, historically, uh, everyone has been using SIP mostly for calls. And everyone has been using XMPP mostly for instant messaging and presence. Now, that doesn't mean that the protocols can't do the rest of the stuff. You can do instant messaging with SIP, you can do presence with SIP, and you certainly can do calling with XMPP. The thing is that historically, both protocols have been used for different things, and that you can very easily feel the impact of that um, in servers, for example, there's very, it's very, very hard to find a media server for XMPP today, and it's also very hard to find a decent, uh, simple um, um, instant messaging and presence implementation for SEP. Um, so uh, while it is in, um, really extremely trivial to get um, your contact list with all the avatars from an XMPP server, uh, doing the same thing with SIP uh, requires you to run three different protocols 
you need SIP, you need uh, XGAP, which runs on top of, X of HTTP, and you need MSRP, which you need for, uh, for the instant messaging. So these are completely three completely different problems. With, you need, uh, programs, you need three different servers, and y you don't really have a lot of choice when you want to do that. So what we thought is that um, we wanted to make it possible for Jitsi, for people deploying Jitsi uh, in, in, in a university, for example. This is something that um, um, we, we tried at the University of Strasbourg. Um, if you want to have an, a, um, a solution that does um, instant messaging in presence and has contact lists and can share files in the same time as audio and video calls, and you want to use specific SIP servers because you want to interconnect to the public telephone network, you want to have things such as voicemail or things like call pickup, directed transfers, and that kind of stuff, then you really want to use SIP for the, for the telephony and XMPP for the instant messaging. And uh, with um, Jitsi, now you can do so. That's uh, something we are... Uh, we've called CUSAX, for, which stands for Combined Use of SIP and XMPP. Uh, it's... Uh, protocol that's uh, currently in the last stages of standardization on the ITF, it should be, uh, it should be an RFC relatively soon. Um, so I thought I'd mention it here in case some of you are wondering, um, need, it, need to deploy a working um, infrastructure for real-time communication in an organization where you are involved. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can always ask me questions later if you want me to come back to that. Um, now, Something that we've spent a lot of effort on during the last several months, actually almost a year now, more than a year, um, is Jitsi Video Bridge. And um, it's a server-side application that allows you to do conferences uh, for both audio and video. And um, here's what's special about it. Normally, Traditionally, when people did audio conferencing, it always happened the same way. You call a media server through whatever protocol, you, you behave as if that's a simple one-to-one -one call, you send your media, and in return, you get a single audio stream, but that audio stream contains the mixed content of everyone else. And this is okay for audio, because mixing audio is really a lightweight process, uh, so much so that you can do it on your own computer. That's why we were able to do audio mixing in Jitsi, and that runs on most modern computers today. Uh, the reason for this is that mixing audio is, ex is an extremely simple process. It's just adding integers, basically, if you put it very roughly. Um, you just do additions, and there you go. You have your mixed audio stream. In practice, it's a little bit more complicated, but not extremely more so. It, it's certainly not from the perspective of a computer. It's maybe of a CPU. Maybe it's, um, it, it requires some thought in, in terms of implementing, synchronizing, and making sure that it, it doesn't go beyond the borders of, uh, beyond your ranges, beyond the ranges that you're supporting. But it's, it's something that's very easy to accomplish for uh, a, uh, any CPU today. Now, video mixing is something that is way harder than that. And why is that? Now, in order to get video mixing, what you need to do in general um, is receive four different streams in a central point. So four people have calls established, video calls established to um, a, 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 a some sort of a video media server. And the video media server is supposed to take all of these streams, decode them, scale them down so that they would fit in a single image, re-encode the new image, and uh, send it to everyone. Now, and that needs to happen at least 25 times a second. This is extremely heavy. Uh, if you've tried doing um, regular real-time video on your computer, you've probably already noticed uh, that it's quite, um, it's quite CPU intensive. Imagine if you had to do that uh, for four, five, six different persons. Um, so traditionally, um, that's how video mixing was being achieved. Yes, sorry? Sure, go ahead. Behind you. Oh, 
Ok, now it is. Yes. yes thank you. Uh, Wei, um, can't you just um, change the schema so that the, the four clients, the four video clients, just send, uh, send an ar uh, already scaled down uh, um, image, uh, video stream, uh, and then the server, instead of decoding, uh, um, laying them on the same, uh, on the same uh, frame and encoding again, just send four already encoded video streams to all the listeners? We'll get there. In, in a couple of slides. <laughs> um, so that's how video mixing has been accomplished uh, for many years, but it's uh, always required dedicated DSPs and um, things that are extremely expensive, and that's why video conference has been traditionally a very expensive thing. Certainly not something that you can run on your old computer. That's not, that's out of the question. What you could do, however, is exactly what you asked about, and you don't even need to scale down the initial images. You just keep sending whatever you send normally. It gets to the server, and when it gets there, it doesn't get decoded, it doesn't get scaled down. The server is simply going to take your packet and send it to everyone else. Now, yes, that's going to require a little bit more bandwidth, but bandwidth today, that kind of bandwidth uh, is way easier to find than a CPU that can handle that in real time. Um, we did that in Jitsi itself uh, in the beginning of 2012, and then we thought, well, that still requires a user, not a server, but a user to have that bandwidth. At least one of the participants in the conference needs to be able to send all these streams to everyone else. So you see we have in a four-person, in a four-member conference, we have a total of nine streams going out. Um, I'd say that depending on how much you move, um, that's approximately um, 200 kilobits per second per stream. Um, so you can do the math. And uh, that kind of upstream is rarely available today, unless you're working at a university, for example. Uh, if you do that on a server, however, now that becomes a lot easier to find. There are machines out there that you can get for uh, 20 euros a month or even less, and they can very well cope with that task. So we did this XMPP extension protocol that we called Colibri. Uh, which allows you to take that part of Jitsi that did this packet shifting uh, and put it on a server. It's an XMPP component, so you connect it to an XMPP server, and the organizer of the conference controls it through the XMPP server. So here's how this works. Basically, when you want to set up a conference between several clients, the organizer just tells the Jitsi video bridge, hey, um, could you please open a conference for me with three different channels, three different sets of ports, and send me back your address and the port numbers that you allocated for me? The server responds, and when the focus, the, 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 the organizer of the conference sets up the calls, instead of sending its own addresses to the other participants, it sends the address you would got from the Jitsi video bridge. As a result, when the call is set up, everyone would end up sending their stream to the Jitsi video bridge, thinking that this is actually the focus, which is okay. Uh, and then the Jitsi video bridge is going to take care of the, all the relaying and making sure that everyone gets all the media. This is um, basically, it's, it's as if we just exported onto a server the relaying part of Jitsi, because none of these clients has to know anything about that Colibri extension that I talked about. Uh, not that knowing about it is a bad thing, it's an open extension, we just need to write it down because we have been lagging a little bit, but you can always look at the code and see how it works. Um, but um, maybe because you want to be able to interoperate with standard clients that don't support Colibri, and you can do that with this uh, with this extension. It could also work with SIP because, as I said, the only communication that, that's dependent on XMPP in this case is the part that allocates the channels. Uh, so once you, once you allocate the channels and, and get the IP address of the video bridge, you can still invite everyone over SIP and telling them, hey, I'm Emil and I'm calling you from this IP address. And then the clients can, can start uh, sending media there and you end up in exactly the same situation. Question. Uh, 
Um, what about encryptation? I mean, now we need to trust this server, isn't it? The server is receiving the whole video in uh, plain. What was the first sentence? Uh, what about encryptation? encryption? I mean, yeah. when I'm when I'm talking with someone by XMPP, I am encrypting between him and me and the server. No, you're not. With OTR, for example, yes. W yes, that yes. Okay. So. Um, Currently, GT video conferences are encrypted when, the, uh, when they're hosted on GT. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you want to encrypt the video bridge hosted conferences. This is currently a work in progress. Right now, there's actually someone working on that. Um, and uh, we should have DTLS for the video bridge um, within, I, I'd say, a couple of weeks maybe at the first version. Uh, the reason we chose DTLS here, because you remember I wasn't quite happy with, uh, with what DTLS had to offer uh, like 10 minutes ago, now I'm changing my mind. Well, I'm actually not. Um, the thing is that once you run, um, DTLS gives you a, f a, a, a good encryption, um, how to put that simply. Um, Let's say that in this case, this entity has to be trusted, okay? This ha if, you, if you care about your privacy and you want to do a video conference that's hosted on a bridge somewhere, you have to trust this. Uh, it's, let's say it's almost impossible to have end-to-end uh, end -end encryption in, in this situation without trusting this guy. So once you make that, that assumption that you're trusting this, because, for example, this is something you're running yourself, um, you are your own service provider or you know the service provider and you trust them because it's another member of your community or organization, um, then DTLS is entirely sufficient. And this is something that we're currently working on. Uh, and it would also make GT Video Bridge compatible with, uh, usable with WebRTC clients and browsers. Um, so uh, two questions already and both of them have anticipated something that uh, I was just about to say. Great questions. Next one, please. I was wondering why we need to trust the server. We could uh, share uh, keys for just this conference, uh, coordinated with the, all the clients. How are you going to share the keys? Pair by pair, we could uh, But using what protocol? One, one single uh, encryption key for the whole conference, and now everyone can read it. But how are you going to send that key? Using uh, XMPP. And then you trust your XMPP server, because it can see what you're, what you're exchanging. Uh, no. Mm. If you're, uh, you if you're doing OTR on okay. top of that, for example, then that's something that could work potentially. But uh, you can see that it's a very uh, complex, from a user point of view, it's a complex way of achieving things. Sure. Uh, now, um, let's say that um, multi-party encryption is on the whole, uh, in general, a complex topic because uh, you basically have two ways of doing it. Either one and the same, either everyone has to have a, a, a trusted connection with everyone else, uh, which requires a lot of signaling to get right, uh, or, um, or you need to trust the server, in which case... But, uh, yeah? I, um, I would have to actually think about it, but uh, isn't it possible to extend the diffie hellman protocol to support uh, three um, exchanging parties or more? Well, I you can... I uh, think that it could be possible, if I remember correctly, what happens in the age. Um, is, is there a question there or a comment maybe on... Actually, uh, multi-party OTR is being specified <coughs> and implemented right now. Well, we'd have to look into that. Um, the, re the thing is that you also need to trust your server for other reasons as well. For example, it needs to make sure... Um, it needs to be able to uh, change the media for other reasons as well. For example, you might have neg negotiated different payload types with your different user agents. So it would be, uh, so it would need to change the numbers of the payload types, the dynamic payload types that it's using between the, um, the different clients. So um, it would need to be able to decrypt and then re-encrypt the media um, anyway. So um, if, you, if you try to, 
Well, it's something that we actually need to, to discuss in more detail because it's, uh, uh, it, it's quite technical, but um, I'd be happy to talk about that after. Um, it's, um, if you want to completely eliminate your bridge from the loop and make it entirely incapable of changing anything in what you're saying, uh, that gets you into a whole, um, into, into a number of different issues. Um, and I'm not saying they're unresolvable, but they're hard to get. Yeah. Uh, hello? Okay. Uh, and uh, one solution maybe so to make a simply connection like an SSH, whatever, right, an example, uh, from each machine and then exchange one pair of keys. Then uh, all the people c uh, encrypt with the same key, and all the key people decrypt with the same key, but it's a, it's a throwaway key. It's used uh, only for the session, and it's exchanged via a secure channel peer to peer. Then when it's changed, it's changed each, uh, each peer connect, uh, knows the key and can make the, the encryption the part. Sure, and the same would, it would that actually is the same thing as using uh, separate setting up different OTR channels with everyone, and and then you have a trusted connection with anyone, and then you generate a key and send it to anyone else. But even in this case, um, this puts us in the same situation where um, if you don't want to trust the bridge at all, then you are preventing it from doing a number of other things for you, like for example, redefining the payload types. Uh, or mixing audio in some cases, um, being able to change the packets. For example, in the video bridge, we still mix audio. Uh, why? Because it's cheap. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot to do. It saves you a little bit of bandwidth. It simplifies the negotiation. And contrary to video, there are a whole lot of different audio codecs, so it's a lot easier to get codec mismatches. Um, it's a lot more difficult to make sure that there's a single codec that everyone in the conference supports. So we thought, oh, you know, we'll just mix the audio. Um, if you have an Android client, for example, joining into a video conference, then the video bridge would definitely want to mix the audio and maybe just choose one or two of the video streams that are being relayed and then change them um, and switch between them. So um, the video bridge needs to be able to do stuff with the media. So that means that it has to change the packet so it needs to know um, it needs to know the encryption, well, the encryption mechanism that's being used. So you can probably come up with something that's going to work. I never said that that's impossible. It's just that it, it, put, it makes it harder uh, on the whole to achieve the whole conferencing thing. It's, um, if, you, if you eliminate it from, if you tie its hands, it won't be able to help you when you need it to help you. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not being convincing enough, but... Um, we can probably get to that after and, and, and discuss it in more detail. Um, what about uh, graceful degradation? So you have people who you trust, where you can negotiate the encryption directly, and then you don't need to trust the bridge. And then maybe uh, by, by uh, sort of bootstrapping a web of trust on top of the star of people that you trust directly, there are people that you can negotiate through trusted parties. And, and, and one of these entities could be the bridge. How much do you trust the bridge? If I set it up, I trust it completely, maybe. And then also, for every specific use, like a teleconference, you can say, how much do I need privacy? So if I say, for instance, I want expediency, not privacy, then the client can be like, okay, so for this call, you trust the bridge. Uh, you don't care to even have to wait for negotiated strong encryption, even if you could do it. So then you, you have graceful degradation of the privacy. Um, do you want me to take the microphone? Or? So let, let me remind you something. If you want to have an encrypted session in that with, with everyone else without requiring trust for anyone else but yourself and your peers, you can do that today with Jitsi. You just need to have the bandwidth so that you can stream to everyone. That's already supported. In that case, Jitsi is being the video bridge. Jitsi does all the... Um, all the rewriting of the, media, of, the, of, the, of the payload types, but that's okay because you're one of the participants in the conference, so you are trusted anyway. So you can do that. And in that case, you have graceful degradation because um, your user interface uh, and everyone else's is going to show um, 
this, these persons are who they are, and, um, and, and we have encrypted uh, sessions with them. And this last participant, uh, well, we haven't been able to establish a ZRDP connection with him uh, or her. And uh, in that case, um, well, you, you'll be aware of what's going on. Um, if you want to use the video bridge, then you are going to be guaranteed that everything going to the video bridge is being sec secured, that no one is able to read what's going on except for the video bridge. It's just something that it's a requirement in our design. You have to, we need, we use the GT video bridge too much and we can't get away from um, not trusting it. Otherwise, the whole thing falls down. But um, that doesn't mean that Y y you trust y y you your sessions with the video bridge is going to be exposed in any way. You can very way you can very easily use a public private key pair uh, on the video bridge or a certificate that you have signed yourself with your own certificate authority um, or, or even a PGP pair. Uh, you can you would be able to do that, and that's going to work. It's just, it has to be your video bridge. There's another question there. No question, okay. So um, the last thing that I was going to say is that yes, we're currently working on the security with, uh, uh, with the video bridge. We're going to start by DTLS. Um, and initially you would have to be able to trust the machine that's hosting the conference unless uh, you want to host the conference yourself. Uh, and we're also going to be adding support for TrickWise to the bridge so that you can use it for uh, WebRDC clients. Um, and um, that's the end of the official part of the presentation. I'm very much enjoying the questions, so if you have any more, keep them coming. So... I was uh, just, you know, because of what you said uh, mm -hmm. before in answer to my last question, I was thinking, yeah, again, ca maybe, and uh, of course you can have anything if you're willing to code it, but uh, maybe you can have a situation where um, you have, uh, uh, like I understand the basic situation of the, of the video conference is, is, is processor and bandwidth intensive. And uh, me, I'm not uh, a security freak, so you know but but then there are people who are so maybe you could have a situation where you have channels going out in a star but they are not bandwidth or processor intensive so you could have for instance uh, i could have the the video coming uh, to and from the video bridge but a control channel to every participant where i'm basically negotiating negotiating identity with them so as long as you got this control channel open with me and can identify yourself uh, periodically through it, then I trust you're the one that, uh, uh, that are there. And um, I don't know, we could even run some basic checks to try to, uh, to flush out man in the middle, stuff like that. And, and again, this is, if I trust the video bridge because I'm running it or one of my friends is running it, who cares? If I don't care about the security of the video conference, who cares? But there might be situations uh, where I'm not being paranoid. I don't know who the hell's running the video bridge, but I still care. I still care to have as much security as I can in a situation where I understand I, I, I can't have really good security. So you take a look at the, at the cryptologic uh, objectives and you say, this one? No, I can't do that one. But this one, maybe. And if it takes a, a low bandwidth control channel, uh, then I don't see why not. So again, yes, you can do that. But in that case, you would have to eliminate the bridge from helping you. In, and in our case, we are relying on the bridge doing a number of things for us. We are relying on it being able to mix the audio to make sure that we're getting the video with the payload types that we expect to get. And we won't be able to do that. It is possible to... Uh, it, it's very easily, uh, it's very easy actually to make sure that um, the bridge runs with a certificate that you have signed and you're only trusting that certificate. The problem is not in getting it to, I should say that, um, 
the problem is not in getting the security and eliminating, preventing the bridge from seeing what's in the media. The problem that is that if you do that, then the bridge won't be able to do all of the things that it's currently doing. And, 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 it, and it is possible to get a simple media proxy that relays to everyone, but that's not something that would fit our requirements. Uh, we want to be relatively, uh, we want to make the bridge relatively easy to use with other SIP agents. With, we don't want it to be specific to GT. We want it to work with WebRDC as well. Maybe in a single call, have web browsers, uh, GT clients, and other empathy clients if they, um, not actually that should work even with, with not a lot of effort, I believe. So we want that to be possible to happen. And uh, for that, we need the, little, the bridge to be a little bit more smarter, not too smart. We don't want it to start decoding video and all that. But we do want it to be able to change payload ties, maybe mix video, be able to read the RTCP packets. And uh, that's actually very important. It has to be able to read RTCP. So um, yeah. It's part, it's not, it's not only a security, it's not only an encryption program, it's, uh, it's not a, an encryption problem at all, actually. It's, it's all the other requirements that, that come with it. Okay, uh, was that five minutes or was that over? Five minutes, okay, so uh, a couple more questions. Oh, one minute. So one more question. Okay, well, um, we'll be hanging around. There's also Jana from Jitsi here. She's actually the person who has written the highest number of lines of code in Jitsi. So, uh, applause <laughs> for her. <laughs> and uh, we'll be hanging around until tonight. If you want to chat with us, just, uh, yeah, just get by us and uh, talk to us. Thanks.